Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Thank you if that team, especially Patricia and also partners, Stefano. It's a real delight to work with you on this hot topic of geopolitics of technology. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Internet as the defining technology of our time together with its byproduct data have become the key source of economic growth and political power. Today, the five most valuable companies in the US and the three most valuable companies in China are all tech companies. And then there is no surprise that the leadership of technology has become a key geopolitical concern for the world leaders. Well, we're supposed to have on the screen a quote. Could you please make sure that the slide is moving? Well, it's a quote from Indian Prime Minister Modi, who sees data as a source of hegemony. I will continue until we resolve the issue of a slide. So uh, please, once you could, move to the next slide. The challenge in understanding this intersection is that both geopolitical context and internet governance are volatile, constantly changing, and they're multiplex, involving or consisting of many elements in a complex relationship. What is more, the two concepts are incompatible. Internet is transnational and borderless, while geopolitics is a territorial construct with clear borders. Ideological differences shape the uh, visions uh, for Internet, but cultural values are also matter. For example, between freedom of speech and privacy, U.S. values the former, where the Europe emphasized the latter. Could we please move to next slide? And next slide. Uh, next slide, please. I think you moved too fast. Uh, previous one, please. Uh, next one, please. Sorry. Nick, yes. Here is a good demonstration of internet governance multiplexibility. Uh, as you can see in this slide, internet is layered. The top layers or the content and application layers are where most end users interact. The middle layers are the logic layer, where codes reside. The bottom layers are the physical infrastructure layers, where all the pipes and fiber optics are located. The unique combination of physical and virtual properties of the cyberspace poses complex governance challenges. As a basic rule, bottom layers are maintained collabor collaboratively by the countries involved as a cross-border and global technical structure. But the top application and content layer are more susceptible to national laws. What makes it particularly hard to govern is that uh, that attacks from the information layer where costs are low in one country can be launched against the physical domain where resources are expensive and located in another country. Next slide, please. This is a regime complex for mapping global cyber activities. It's particularly useful in locating internet governance within the larger context. It shows the wide range of actors and activities, issues and regimes, reflecting the DNA of the internet the multi-stakeholder model is usually adopted for its governance. As shown in this slide, it includes many actors, the technical community, private sector, civil society, government agency, standards bodies, as well as various regimes from human rights to intelligence and law enforcement to intellectual property. Next slide, please. Next slide, yes. In this slide, the top line is a vision of the Cold War. Iron Curtain symbolized the bipolar, bipolar geopolitics of that era. There was an 
East and West Bloc, Soviet Union, and the United States and their allies. There was essentially no China to speak of, and there was very little economic interaction between the blocs with uh, closed borders. So a very different world. In contrast, now we live, we have a global economy and open border. Uh, next slide, please. Then alignments were ideological. Today, they are loose and opportunistic. Then the key debate was capitalism versus communism. Now it's over democracy versus autocracy. Geopolitics have shifted from bipolar to multipolar um, and has become more inclusive. China is a major and rising power, but there are other important countries like India, which is technologically sophisticated, yet very poor. Tech giants have become independent geopolitical forces. Local government's power was at full display during pandemic. We also see civil society's power and at, at the global scene. So it's a very different context. Next slide, please. Internet governance inevitably runs into ideological differences and regions of the internet and the future we desire. Concepts range from Silicon Valley's open internet and its motto that data wants to be free to Washington's market-based internet. If data is the new oil, then let's drill it. The European model, we would like to control this if we can figure out how to do it, and the Chinese model is we are going to control this firmly. And uh, of course, Russia, finally, Russia's uh, not much of ideology, but strategy as an spoiler by spreading this and misinformation aimed to disrupt the internet, the international order. Next slide, please. Internet governance mirrors the geopolitical context. The divide is visible across the democratic lines, yet it's an oversimplification to treat it as a simple bipolar dispute over liberal versus authoritarian approach. What really matters are digital deciders, countries whose alignments are opportunistic. On the screen is the list of countries with their aggregate scores. The higher the score signals higher influence. Next slide, please. The Internet pioneers' vision for, inter uh, for Internet was influenced by neoliberal ideals of freedom from government and 1960s counterculture of individual liberty and privatization. They developed the internet as a borderless global village with a decentralized open distributed architecture. Internet embodies many democratic elements. It has democratized information, enabled freedom of speech, and has potential to create a global public square. It could facilitate government transparency and accountability. It could offer opportunities for participatory and deliberative democracy. Its bottom-up architecture enables citizen activism and mobilization. The power of the internet in the hand of a generation born to it is in full display in current Iranian uprising, where the Generation Z, practically kids equipped with their cell phones, are challenging a brutal regime of Ayatollahs. Hashtag Mahso Amini in one month has gained 300 million tweets. Compare that with hashtag Ukraine with 250 million since February and Black Lives Matter with 63 million in six years. We now see the power in the hand of young generation. Next slide, please. But as internet became commercialized and popular, it gave rise to undemocratic trends and geopolitical tensions. Today, rise of populism, political polarization, loss of trust in political system and traditional media and disinstitutionalization are all blamed on internet technology. While blaming the internet as a cause of democracy setback is debatable and current problems cut much deeper, but there is no doubt that internet not only exacerbated these trends, but also created new ones, especially in geopolitical scene. Next slide, please. 
It was this concerns that resulted in a host of legislation and self-regulation. Over the last decade, the two top rules, I'm sorry, previous uh, slide, show that key areas of legislation which are mainly at content and application level. More recently, previous slide, please. More recently, increasing reliance of critical, no, previous slide. More recently, increasing reliance of critical services on digital technology elevated national security concerns, while pandemic highlighted dependency for services on foreign-owned controlled enterprises, sensitizing concern over sovereignty, and posing doubts on the wisdom of globalization and open internet as its po poster child. Increased geopolitical tension and China's ambitions over control of internet have pushed internet governance into the center of geopolitics and has turned internet fragmentation to a real concern. At stake is the open and universal architecture of the internet and its multi-stakeholder model of governance. So far, the open and universal internet has shown a remarkable resilience, but how long and how far can it endure the ideological pressures? This is a significant moment as decisions about the internet governance is coming under renewed scrutiny. And the outcome could be determinant, not just for the technology, but also for our democracy, democratic values and lifestyle. And on that note, we are lucky to have Gregory Traverton to lead the conversation. He brings a vast knowledge and intimate experience of geopolitics currently as the chairman of the Global Technopolitics Forum and as the chairman of the National Intelligence Council during Obama administration. Floor is yours, Greg. Thanks, Barry. And again, let me extend my thanks or, or thanks to our partners, IFPD and their sponsors. It's a great pleasure to do this together. Um, I, I could spend most of our time introducing the panelists, so let me not do that. Let me just uh, have you see it on the, on the screen. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, David Bray, I've had the uh, opportunity to work with in several different capacities. Uh, we wrote a paper together some years ago, and then he was uh, head of the Geotech Center at the Atlantic Council. Uh, as I said, I, I could spend all our time talking about his bio and the others. Uh, suffice to say, great to have you with us, David. Next slide. Jeff Goodell, I really only got to know through Pari. He has a very distinguished career in finance, and I don't think we should hold his PhD from Harvard against him. Next slide, please. Sean Canuck, I had the great uh, pleasure to work with when I was chair of the National Intelligence Council and he was National Intelligence Officer for Cyber. He's been in this business for a very long time and we look forward to, it's great to reconnect Sean and look forward to our conversation. Let me, uh, uh, let's do this conversationally. We'll uh, have a conversation among ourselves and then open it for a few minutes of Q&A at the end. Uh, but let me start with you, Sean. I know you've been worrying about something relatively specific but very important. And that is a verifiable digital identity. It's really the question of should the internet be less anonymous and what would be the costs and benefits of that set of circumstances? How do you think about that balance? Well, thank you, Greg, and thank you to everyone for uh, joining us today and inviting me to participate in this conversation. Uh, as I listened to Pari's presentation, the geopolitical concerns and the national security concerns and the international economic concerns uh, that she addressed, many of those political and economic concerns actually have a commonality in where they would actually uh, have a role in implementation. And for me, that is the digital identity that you just referred to, Greg. Um, how do you actually implement a social credit score in China? How do you maintain secret ballot voting in an American or European style election? 
You know, it's all based on whether or not you can identify the actor in an authoritative way. And when we talk about online activity, whether it's for financial transactions, political participation, uh, privacy and free speech, as I've studied this over the years, it continuously comes back to whether or not individuals can operate with strong digital identities that are confirmable or whether they are permitted, and that's both technologically and legally, whether they are permitted to join in online activities without specifically identifying themselves. And you talk about the pros and cons for each. Uh, let me just give a couple examples. We could, we could hold a whole conference on digital identity, and in fact, they do. I think we could. But, uh, but you know, a couple examples. If you're trying to do financial transactions, whether they're stock trades or SWIFT transfers of, you know, for electronic wire transfers between banks, uh, you want to be able to know who's sending that information and authorizing that financial transaction. That is a part of being able to confirm the system and do clearing of trades, et cetera, et cetera. And even where a broker is doing it on your behalf, or you're doing it through an institution, it still is a verifiable transaction, okay? And there's a lot of people who would agree that they want to be able to affirm financial transactions in a way that the neither party can repudiate them or pretend that they don't have to fulfill the obligations under that agreed transaction that was documented. So there's an example where a lot of folks would want strong digital identity. Uh, if you're doing e-voting like in Estonia, you probably want strong digital identity to make sure each person is only voting once. Now, their identity and who they voted for may not be broadcast, but you're gonna want a digital system that registers voters and the devices they're gonna use and allows each person to only vote once if you believe in the democratic ideal of one person, one vote. Now, let's think about some of the cons of having strong identifiable information uh, of users. You know, we see it in America where people have always wanted to have freedom of anonymous political speech. And, you know, I come from a political culture there where I do see the benefit of that or privacy. Uh, of your interactions and your communications, certainly in a social and cultural context, what organizations you may choose to belong to. Uh, you may not want all of that broadcast or your social media that you don't put on your public facing wall or, or broadcast elements. So I see that desire too from a political culture. Uh, and of course, in that context, we see the other extreme in the Chinese system of social credit score, where in order to be using the internet in China, you have to be a registered user, which is linked to your real physical identity and uh, ultimately impacts your opportunities within that society, whether it's employment opportunities, uh, travel privileges within or without the country, uh, those all get impacted by your online activity, including what you say about the central government there. So I think I've hopefully given a couple examples, not only of why identity is so critical, but also of different instances where people may want strong identification or weak identification, depending on you know, the context and which political culture you're coming from. So let me stop there. I look forward to the rest of our discussion on this topic uh, and the others. So thank you very much. Great, thanks, Sean. Let me, let me go next to you, David. I know, David, you've been thinking about very big issues. That's really the intersection of the internet and open societies with on the one hand, technology and where it's produced and on the other with the future of space, which is increasingly important in all our cyber technologies. How, do, how should we think about that cluster of issues? What are the most important points you would cite? Sure, and, and again, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Pari, to be here. Thanks for um, this great conversation. Let me try to build on what both Sean and Pari uh, just said, which is, what if we're in a world in which there is no easy button to these issues, even if we are pitching it as such. Um, I can remember on the identity question, uh, the United States has had at least 20 years of the government trying to solve the federal identity issue. First, it was the government was gonna do it, then the private sector was gonna do it. None of those have worked out. And, and, and having worked with Vint Cerf, he said, you know, we are always intended to circle back to TCP IP and have an identity layer that was going to be tackled in the 70s. But, uh, you know, events overcame events, you know, and it never got tackled. Um, but I raise that because as I was looking at Pari's conversation, what if 
you know, again, it's that challenge of you want to have free speech for certain societies, but that also means you now permit disinformation and misinformation unless you have the truth police. What if you want to have identity, but you don't want to have surveillance state or surveillance capitalism? What if the cat's already out of the bag in the sense that 2013 was the year there was actually the same number of network devices on the planet as there were humans? Two years later, there was 15 billion network devices on the face of the planet, not all connected to the Internet, and only 7.3 billion human beings. We're now at about 50 billion network devices relative to just hitting 8 billion people um, this week uh, on the planet. So we are the minority. Um, the number of bot-related traffic, 2013 was the year that we humans were now the minority on the internet as well. Uh, and it's only going to get harder. Um, you may have just seen, uh, I believe it was Intel is now heralding that they now have a machine that can actually supposedly verify deep fakes. To me as a technologist, that's challenging because if it can identify deep fakes, then I just take a generative adversarial network and pitch it against that machine until it works. It's predator prey. The moment you have something that can say this is bad or good, then neural networks will train about it until they can fool the system. Uh, and so space only complicates things. Uh, there has been a quiet commercial space revolution that's going on. Uh, we are now a little bit more than 8,000 satellites in orbit, but by the end of the decade, 2030, conservatively, we're looking at 100,000 or more satellites in orbit. And I would ask our European friends, does GDPR apply to observations taken from space? And how are you ever going to get consent? Uh, if a financial transaction happens on a satellite that is going at 1,700 miles per hour in low Earth orbit, um, who's going to handle the financial transaction? What's the tax implications of that? And if you need to ever pull the hard drive, where do you pull the hard drive? And so we may be going into a world in which neither private sector nor government can solve this alone. And we may be surprised that what's missing is community-centric approaches. Um, I mean, again, Pari was talking about how we are dealing with a planet that has at least five major corporations, and we'll see with the tech bursts that may be happening, maybe that'll get changed. But in 2017, there were five corporations that had a larger market cap than all the GDP of all the nations in the world, minus the top four. And so that raises the question, you know, we have a State Department, different other um, governments have ministries of foreign affairs or things like that. Are they talking to the wrong people? And the solution I don't think is regulation. The solution is to require them to have some community input and involvement, which is not something that the Internet has historically done well. I mean, even ICANN and what they do generally does not go to the community level because that's hard and there's so many different communities. But I think we may be facing a world in which the existing paradigms we evolved in the 19th and 20th century to try and address these issues are insufficient just because the moment you make one choice, you're going to find there's drawbacks on the other side. Well, space is a wonderful example of that, isn't it, David? Because it is uh, increasingly privatized. But all those new satellites going up are not, not government satellites. We grew up in a period when space was a government monopoly. Now it's basically a private sector place, and therefore how you build that kind of community with the private sector, I think, is the, the critical it's issue. It's an incredibly hard question. And the other thing is, while it is getting privatized, you also have nation state actors that will remain nameless saying, you know what, maybe we might just shoot at a satellite because, you know, and so when you declare a act of war on a private company, you know, it, it gets very messy very fast. And what we don't realize is, is a collision event in space can make it so that none of us could use space for the next 75 to 100 years. Um, and so where in the past you had a red red line between the United States and the Soviet Union, if you needed to pick up the phone and say you need to move your satellite now to avoid a collision event. Now it's multiple state actors, including small states like UAE, which has launched a rocket that actually sent a probe to Mars. Um, so it's small state actors, but it's also large corporate actors. And again, going from 8,000 to 100,000 in, in, in eight years. Um, but again, you also see proposals to have um, 15 to 20 teraflops per satellite of processing power in orbit, uh, data centers on the moon. And so if we think we can continue to address and or regulate these things using terrestrial geography, it's going to be insufficient. The answer is not to also go to the UN. Sorry, UN, as much as I love you, you're not the answer there either. We've got to figure out ways that communities can express at least one or two goals. Uh, let me sort of make this really, really real concrete for folks real quick. Back when COVID was happening in the early days of 2020, um, the United States was rolling out testing facilities. And so they said, we're going to actually place testing facilities where people live. 
Uh, but it turned out in the southeast of the United States, uh, they came to the conclusion as they rolled out these testing facilities, they concluded falsely, it was incorrect, that if you're Hispanic or if you were black, you were less likely to get tested. But it turned out where people lived in the southeastern United States was not where they worked. They worked, unfortunately, 30 or 45 minutes away. And if these testing facilities open from nine to five, that's a bad placement of a testing facility. It turned out data, anonymized data from these large corporations I was just talking about, which, you know, again, one could debate whether that's a good or bad thing, revealed that that actually they should have placed it where people worked. So the administration changed its policy. They focused on where people worked. And sure enough, any racial disparities disappeared. A year later, when they were rolling out the testing, not the testing, but the vaccine for COVID, again, if you can remember the early days, you had to be above a certain age. I think it was either 55 or 60. And again, you literally had major newspapers, including New York Times, claiming that there was a racial disparity in people wanting to get the vaccine for COVID. But unfortunately, again, for historically unjust reasons, if you're in the United States and you're above a certain age, you're more likely to be Caucasian, which can be revealed in that data. And that's data that's from a private entity that can actually be anonymized and used as a force to good to inform policymaking. But we rarely have those interactions between what the private sector is seeing and what the government is seeing to inform better policymakers and actually to overcome misplaced or displaced beliefs in which, you know, once they removed the age restriction, there was no racial disparity in wanting to actually get COVID vaccine. But for a while there, the narrative was running, there was vaccine hesitancy in groups when in fact it was a policy choice on the age. And so I'm not a fan of the idea that data is a new oil, because oil, once you use it up, you use it up. Data is one of those things that you can give it to someone and keep a copy. That's both a good and bad thing. But we've got to think about more community-centric ways of aligning goals for the use of data to benefit communities at the ground level and then bubble up from there. Thank you, David. That's a, that's a good background to my question for Jeff. I want to bring you in. Um, you've been thinking about whether there are features intrinsic mm -hmm. to the design of the internet that have set the stage for the abuse of power and whether there's anything we can do about it. Uh, what are the important points there? Uh, th thank you, David, uh, Gregory. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, excellent, just uh, checking. Um, we can't yes. see you, but we can hear you. No, perfect. And apologies for uh, apologies for that. Uh, well, well, I think that this actually is uh, the the answer to the, the question about uh, well, the answer to your question is actually related to the question uh, of why you can't see me, uh, which is that uh, as it turns out, uh, Microsoft Teams does not work with privacy protecting user agents such as the Firefox browser in particular, um, unless. Uh, unless uh, there, uh, with with certain exceptions, and they cannot do video yet. Uh, and this is an example of a of a principle that seems to have uh, uh, have been been a reality on the internet for uh, quite some time, which is that basically, if you can uh, exploit network effects to get people onto your platform, then you can set the rules. And if you can set the rules, then you can force people to reveal information about themselves and lower their defenses and and so on. Uh, so uh, I think the, uh, the 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 core of the question was about the about the design of the internet, though, uh, and uh, and and this was something that I had the good fortune to uh, actually have a conversation with uh, uh, with uh, Bob Kahn, uh, who uh, was effectively uh, uh, Vint Cerf's sponsor uh, back in the day uh, and one of the co-founders of the internet, um, uh, and he had eff effectively said that well in the beginning. Uh, we had to create a network that people would uh, would want to use and would be able to use easily. Uh, and uh, the question that I had was, why is it that we trust the network to make routing decisions, to, to expose so much information about the end-to-end -end conversations in the internet? And this goes back to, uh, to Perry's slide about the, uh, the various uh, protocols in the internet stack. And as it turns out, uh, an internet... Um, uh, 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 a conversation at the IP layer uh, reveals the source and the destination, uh, and can and the routers in between get to determine where the uh, where the traffic will flow, uh, so that uh, as Bob Kahn had said, um, the new entrants to the internet don't have to worry about collecting global routing tables and do all the source routing themselves. They can rely upon the network to do that. Um, but unfortunately, when we made that decision with the internet, we created this massive uh, uh, control point or set of control points that could ultimately be exploited. Uh, and exploited they were. Uh, now we see that 
ordinarily, um, when many of us are using the internet, m many of us don't have globally routable IP addresses, for example. And those of us who do have globally routable IP addresses are probably behind firewalls that have been imposed by our network carriers. Um, as a result, we're not really true peers in the internet. The, peers in the internet are, are ones who can run servers who are effectively uh, a limited set, more or less, of uh, very powerful actors. And uh, for individuals who want to get this power, they can, but they have to be relatively technically sophisticated. They have to stump up a certain amount of money and so on. And as a result, we've seen this, this, uh, this kind of two-tiered reality uh, by design in the internet. And that's, uh, and that's a problem. Um, but it's not the only problem. So I think that one of the comments that, uh, so Sean brought up some interesting points in particular uh, about, about uh, individuals' uh, identities and being identified. Well, it turns out that when we use services that run on the internet today, uh, we are revealing intrinsically something about our identities. It's being revealed through our IP addresses, which we use to connect to the network. It's being revealed even through the fingerprints of our browser. Uh, and you'll be surprised perhaps to know that many CAPTCHA engines that, uh, that allow us to uh, input uh, uh, pictures of fire hydrants and chimneys and such, often what they're relying upon increasingly is not user input, but rather browser fingerprints to be able to make judgments uh, about whether someone is the same someone who existed here before and did a particular thing, whether, that, whether there are certain profiles that are more likely to... Uh, to uh, uh, be uh, to create abuse and so on, uh, but the power to do that is the power to segment users into populations. And if someone were to log into a website uh, and uh, using a browser that is fingerprinted, uh, then ultimately later when they use the browser not logged into a website, but they still have the same fingerprint, all of the credentials that were linked to that to that login that they used can now be linked to their other browsing habits. And that's quite dangerous. Um, and furthermore, uh, while there are, while they're in the context of the internet, there are uh, approaches to avoiding this kind of profiling and discrimination. Um, ultimately, these, uh, such as, for example, using the Tor browser, um, Ultimately, there are gatekeepers such as Akamai and Cloudflare that have very vast networks of, uh, of uh, uh, web hosting services that run many services around the world and effectively discriminate explicitly against users who are trying to be anonymous. Uh, and, ex ex and effectively, they are requiring de facto users to identify themselves as a prerequisite for using the various sites that use them as hosting, uh, hosting engines. Great. And yet, we know that they're common, and this is a big problem. Well, thank you. Thank you. Sean, a, a reaction from you? Uh, I thank Jeff for introducing some of those concepts. I wholeheartedly concur with everything he said. Uh, he took my uh, varsity level discussion and raised it to the university or graduate school level. And I think it's uh, very worthwhile for this audience that you know, the different levels of sophistication by different users and the positioning of different entities who can force compliance uh, with, uh, by individuals who wanna use their platforms. And it really becomes you know, a supply side ability to force actions by uh, individual users. So uh, thank you, Jeff, for uh, elevating our conversation. All very good points that I concur with. Great. David. So if I could pull from two events that are currently making headlines and are obviously a train that is is playing itself out, uh, how, how badly it's off the rails is to be decided. First is clearly Twitter is not doing a great job with its blue check mark. Um, when you see multiple cases of uh, former, supposedly former US presidents getting the blue check mark that their identity has been validated. I'm not saying Twitter should be the beacon. If anything, it should not be the hallmark of how to go about do user verification, but it's one of those things that you currently do not see a nation state government at the moment following up. We'll see if January or February, once the US Congress is back in session, what happens next. But the other one is um, talking about uh, crypto. Uh, for a long time, there was the misperception that if you're using Bitcoin, somehow you were anonymous. Uh, when in fact it was anything but. 
Uh, if you go and spend a Bitcoin at Starbucks, uh, Starbucks actually knows not only that you are specifically there, but all the miners of Bitcoin know that you are specifically there and they know everything you bought in the past and they will know everything you buy in the future, which is a surveillance state or surveillance capitalism stream. Um, and we talk about compliance and supposedly SEC, the Security Exchange Commission of the United States was about to give the blessing to FTX. And yeah, how did that work out uh, as the gold star? And so... I think the challenge we really have is that these issues are nuanced and a lot of open societies, I'm not going to use the word democratic because I'd like to include our colleagues in Singapore and other places that may not wave the quote unquote democratic banner, but I think they are part of open societies. Not only do they lack within their own legislatures the technology expertise to actually address these nuanced issues, but then they lack the ability for a cohesive framework to work across borders because the technologies we're dealing with, whether they are the internet or the things that write on the internet, cross borders and we lack effective ways of getting things done. And so that's where I keep on coming back to. The only way through this is to go back to first principles, which is what do communities want at the local level? Because you won't find one size fits all, particularly in the United States, which we know there's increasing polarization. Um, and also, I would say balance transparency, which is important with the awareness that some of the problems we might even be having on reaching compromises and solutions might be because now we have radical transparency and nobody can go back to their individual constituents and say, look at the victory I got you and not tell the things they gave up. We may discover that our era of polarization is a linked consequence of increasing 24 seven news and supposed transparency, making it difficult to do the difficult job of globalism, which is compromises versus absolutism. I can't resist asking a, a slightly different sort of question. It seems to me if you look at the geopolitics of technology, the most important recent event is the effective war the United States has declared over chips with China, seeking very long reach regulations that wouldn't permit even American manufactured uh, tools to be used to be exported to China. Is that a good idea, a bad idea? Will it have negative repercussions we don't expect as so often these restrictive things, trade things do. Who'd, who'd like to take a crack at that? Yeah, I'll do a brief, recognize I just went, but I'll do a brief segue and then open to other panel thoughts. Sure. I am very much concerned as we've made, unfortunately, attacking a small island nation of 24 million people all the more attractive because we removed the ability for you to acquire things from that small island nation through trade means. And so I worry that with the CHIPS Act, it is ratcheting up the rhetoric, it is ratcheting up the, there's definitely going to be gray zone conflict in 2013, I'm oh, sorry, 2023. Whether or not it actually bubbles over to kinetic, I think that this has the unintended consequence of why should they, you know, in an era in which we see norms increasingly getting thrown out the window, uh, civil actions getting increasingly thrown out the window, by putting this red line, so to speak, we now make it more attractive to throw out norms even further and or take over Taiwan. And so I am worried that there are going to be second, third, and fourth order effects that, that could have been foreseen that will only make things worse. Okay. Jeff? Do you want uh, to yeah, yeah, uh, Greg, uh, thank you for this. I, I, um, I'm actually uh, interested to uh, follow up to one of David's earlier uh, earlier okay. remarks. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so David, uh, so, um, I'm sorry, to one of Sean's earlier remarks so that David followed up on. Uh, so Sean had mentioned financial transactions, and then David followed up on that um, by uh, raising the cryptocurrency uh, context. Now, the problem with financial transactions is that asset custodians and government authorities and data brokers alike can collect information about how individuals spend their money. And this is not just about uh, financial habits, employment details, major purchases. This is about physical location as people travel, their relationships, their 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 day-to-day -day fine-grained kinds of movements. Uh, and whereas with the internet, there is the option to use Tor or services or systems like this to blend in with others, as well as the op option to disengage entirely from using, say, social media, for example. There is no way to disengage from the economy. Uh, so we need to really think about payments in particular uh, in, in the context of this kind of, this kind of uh, a privacy and ownership question. 
um, because uh, ultimately uh, the, the data that are involved in these kinds of payment transactions, look at ISO 20022 uh, standards that are used by the SWIFT network, for example. I mean, this is a... Uh, uh, th this is assuming that everyone has custodian asset custodians on both ends, every user is identified, every account can be seen in the system, and so on, much like uh, Bitcoin that, uh, that David mentioned. Um, but the problem is that it does, well, the, the problem is that now that we're moving in many cases towards a, uh, an increasingly cashless economy, we're, we're actually forcing people to reveal all of the information that they had previously only revealed in small circumstances now all the time. There are coffee shops that de facto, surprise, surprise, are now requiring people to show ID and log that purchase of that cappuccino at that particular coffee shop at 1034 in the morning uh, for all eternity associated to the identity of the uh, of the transacting party, which is precisely what you do when you flash the uh, the uh, the debit card ID card. Um, so it doesn't have to be this way. I mean, there are cryptocurrencies like Monero and Zcash that uh, that look to uh, a different approach to avoid that permanent record that's bound to an identity. Um, but uh, we can even design, and this is really important, we can even design central bank digital currencies or stable coins to also have these privacy protecting properties. Look at the work of David Chalm with the Swiss National Bank, for example. Um, there are uh, very serious uh, efforts to establish privacy by design in this domain that shouldn't be overlooked. We can achieve regulation for compliance with tax authorities and uh, compliance with AML KYC without creating this 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 record of of uh, the ability for people to look up the uh, uh, the entire histories associated with the transacting party. This is possible. We don't have to compromise, um, but we need to uh, really open the conversation to show how show the way. Uh, thank you. Great. We had a question about that uh, in the chat. I think we've. Uh... Well, I will, I'll you, give one quick 30 second rejoinder on that to, to build on okay. what, what, what was just said is not only is it possible, it's actually you should look at a company called MobileCoin, um, which is currently what they do is the chain itself stores no identifying information. It's when a wallet talks to a wallet that you do your KYC, your know your customer, know your client check, which is just like cash. You know, nothing about cash says that Greg had it before Pari had it before Sean had it before David had it. But when Greg goes and plunks 10,000 US dollars at a bank, that's at a level in which you're gonna say, who is this Greg character and do we know anything about him? And so when you check at the wallet level and not at the chain level, that allows you to have privacy, but at the same time compliance with the rule of law as determined by the local area. Well, to, to, totally agree with that, David. Just to just to respond briefly, uh, uh, totally agree that that's possible. We just have to watch out how that's implemented, right? We right. we we for example, we we want these wallets. They they need to be totally under the control of the users who use them, uh, and they they can't be accounts. And wallets that have trust trust elements inside or secure elements are right. actually are actually just accounts that people carry with them. They're not really they're not really under the control of the users. Uh, so we, need to be we need to be really careful about these devices. And ultimately, if we want a society of ownership, we need people to have a way to hold digital assets that they really control, which is to say that, that need to be built on completely open source um, uh, software and hardware and, and so on. Uh, and yes, we can build it, but we have to be really careful and, and totally agree that this that what gets stored in the ledger should be made to be almost nothing uh, in terms of identifying information. It can be made to be zero, uh, 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 both theoretically and practically. Um, the question ultimately relies is about how what our expectations are for uh, for being able to uh, uh, for users to be able to get true privacy and uh, and true control. And and ultimately that requires us to make some bold statements. Like one of which is going to be, yeah, we need we need to countenance the development of a system that does not allow local regulators to uncover the the spender in a transaction. We need to be bold about that. If we do a Chamberlain-esque kind of, uh, well, you know, unilaterally the police can can uh, can unearth the spender, then then we're in trouble because ultimately the best um, societies, well, the best kinds of governments, the only governments that can be trusted are the ones who don't insist upon trust at the level of the infrastructure that uh, that allow people to engage with each other. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pari, any reactions from you? Well, I would like to add some optimism to the conversation. Uh, without a doubt, there are lots of challenges ahead. 
we have entered into a domain where virtual world that we didn't have really, we weren't equipped for it. And yes, there are many challenges, but what we are doing tonight is a good example of the magic internet has brought to the world. Each of us in one corner of the world and we are talking to global audiences. So yes, there are a lot of challenges and I can go to various points made and we can discuss this. I think I go back to David's point in terms of we need a community to resolve the problems right now. David again mentioned ICANN. ICANN has multi-stakeholder model. By no means it's not perfect, but it's a start. It's a way of attempt to try and uh, find a solution. It's evolving. There are better models are, or other models are evolving. And I think that's what matters. This partnership between uh, various stakeholders to have a dialogue, to have a conversation and to discuss challenges and move forward. I also would like to have your input. We didn't have the chance of having your own uh, input, Greg, and we all very much like to hear your uh, opinion on the matters because I know we are running out of time. That's why I decided I stop and we'd like to hear you. Let me say a word and then I'll turn to Sean. Uh, one of the things that strikes me is, is uh, and maybe the, about the geopolitics of this issue, set of issues, is that in the privacy domain, the two most important pieces of legislation, neither were done by a nation state. Obviously, the most important is GDPR done by the EU. Probably the second most important is the California Act. Uh, done by California, they're somewhat different in concept. The, as we know, the GDPR lets people opt in, while the California Act lets them opt out. So they're quite different. But it is striking to me that uh, uh, that nation states haven't done either. They've done lots, but that the most important have not been nation states. It says something about the geopolitics. Uh, this is a more American point, but it's it's worth noting that while we've uh, been stuck in gridlock, we've been debating Section 230 for years now to for no particular outcome. Uh, meanwhile, California has actually passed recently legislation about curating, trying to make more transparent the algorithms that the big platforms do, and also about safety, trying to protect minors on the platform. Just an interesting observation to me that uh, as we think about communities, it turns out that nation states are obviously still the biggest game in town, but that as David started us so talking about the private sector and space, but also states and other units of government are going to be part of the communities we need to build. Uh, it's a striking piece of the geopolitics for me. Over to you, Sean. Thanks, Greg. And I, I know we're coming up on time here. I just wanted to offer a couple, again, high-level observations. Uh, I greatly appreciate PARI's optimism, and I've been involved in meetings at a lot of those same organizations. But from a very realist perspective, I want to offer three thoughts. First, that I think David mentioned earlier, everyone may not be able to get what they want here. There are gonna be trade-offs and not everyone is gonna get their cake and eat it too. And we just have to accept that. At the UN, everyone is not gonna go home saying we got everything our constituency wanted. Uh, secondly, we're gonna to have to decide who we wanna trust. Is it sovereign governments? Is it giant tech companies? Is it our local police? Is it supranational governments producing digital privacy legislation? We're actually gonna to have to decide who we wanna put our full faith and credit in. And more and more, we're seeing that some, a lot of individuals and companies don't turn to the sovereign as that most trusted entity, especially not when the internal politics of specific entities are incredibly confrontational between the different elements in society. And then my third high level observation is the decisions that do get made about the technology infrastructure whether it's the protocols or the actual physical systems themselves that are installed, will affect what you are and are not able to do. We often think of technology as just expanding opportunity and increasing the things you can do. Well, technology, once implemented, can also limit the things you were able to do. Imagine the difference between roads and rail systems, right? Trains have much less freedom of movement than cars do which have much less freedom of movement than boats do on the open water. And if you create a structure that's more like a rail system of approvals and authorizations to be allowed to transact, don't expect freedom of mobility. So there are trade-offs. We have to pick who we're gonna trust and realize that technology can both empower or delimit. Thank you. 
Thanks, John. We are running out of time. Can I get to both Jeff and David to give us a final comment, two or three minutes most? Sure. Jeff, yes, do you want to go first? I also invite uh, people to look at the chat. There's a very interesting uh, chat going on between our panelists in the chat function. So take a look at that. Yep. Yep. So, uh, so yeah. So we're basically just talking about uh, the uh, the trust envelopes of uh, mobile phones and these assumptions that mobile phones are the future with respect to uh, with respect to payments or even with respect to uh, to how we communicate. I mean, mobile phones are a real problem, right? As as David said correctly. Um, right now, every mobile phone has an IMEI number uh, that speaks to uh, to that speaks to cellular towers uh, and must reveal that IMEI number when it speaks. And and in many countries, including the UK, there are laws that say that you may not change, you must not change the uh, the IMEI number of your phone that your phone presents to a to a uh, cellular tower. And this, strictly speaking, doesn't just apply to phones, it's any kind of device that speaks to cellular towers. Um, but the problem with this, of course, is that that number becomes bound um, very tightly to uh, the particular travel that that, that that device had made. Uh, and if a person is carrying that, then that person's history is completely knowable by the network of towers in the space. The, these devices are compromised by design. What, what I've always encouraged people to do um, to the extent that they can is to no, is to not use mobile phones for ordinary conversation, to just not connect, just not have these devices to the extent that they can afford not to. Uh, and if they want to make phone calls, they can use VoIP lines and make calls using the internet, using devices that uh, have MAC addresses that they can rotate uh, rather than IMEI numbers that are uh, that are ultimately identifying. This is entirely possible and achievable with uh, with devices that look like phones, including devices such as the Pine phone or uh, or the uh, the Librem phone, uh, and and we can see that there is a future in this. Uh, now, as for the particular points about uh, about these technologies with money and these kinds of systems, we have to be really careful about these services. Um, for example, people think that services like Signal uh, are, uh, are private. They're not. Um, ultimately, all of the metadata that are associated with an identity on that network is still captured by the center of the network, even if the content of conversations is not known. I mean, sing Signal isn't different from, from uh, 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 from uh, um, WhatsApp in that sense, right? I mean, at some level, uh, you know, you've basically got all of the information about the graphs that people use when they communicate with people, and uh, and that information is available to the center. And it's much more interesting to have the graph that share that shows who talks to whom, when, and how often. And that's much more interesting than the content of a conversation. Um, so we have to be really careful about the kinds of technologies that underpin uh, these these sorts of things. Uh, I I would like to just. Uh, uh, close this on uh, on the uh, financial transactions, just suggesting it's really, really important for individuals to be able to conduct transactions without revealing their identity. That's really the core of it. Uh, it has to be unbound and unlinked. And if this means that these are devices that uh, that uh, people can use that are open source, that, that are not phones because phones are linked, then then so be it. That's actually the topic of a, of a grant that I have with the uh, uh, in the UK to explore design options for devices that are not phones that allow people to hold uh, digital assets precisely for that reason. Uh, these these questions are hard and, and it needs to be discussed in the open and with policymakers because ultimately uh, this is about not just privacy, but ownership. Can people Great. own their own assets? Thank you. Great, thank you. David, a last word from you? Right, so as much as I appreciate the perspectives of privacy, it is also worth noting, as I was trying to say earlier, that sometimes the problems we're facing are precisely because of choices we have made. Um, the problems we have with spam calls, especially calling the elderly uh, and not being able to trace where those calls are coming from are precisely because of those phones that don't have the ability for law enforcement to track where they come or using VoIP. And, and this is a significant problem. Uh, we know that there are billions of dollars being scammed out of uh, especially elderly individuals using these techniques. And so I just raise that it's, it's it, to think that the world is gonna reach a universal solution on these issues is probably not a reality check. There will certainly be certain communities that say, we want to make privacy paramount. Uh, there's going to be other communities that say, look, I want to fly on airplanes. And if I want to fly on an airplane, guess what? I have to show photo ID. Otherwise, yes, I can take a car or I can take a train. 
Uh, if I want to fly an airplane, then I have a choice. I can go in the long line, which takes a lot of screening, or I can give up a little bit of information and be in the faster line because I gave up information up front. And so I'm not looking for a silver bullet that will solve all these issues because they're multifaceted. And the moment you make one choice, you're going to have negative trade-offs on the other side. You know, if you have complete privacy, you also allow scammers to abuse that privacy. You allow certain nations to get around sanctions. I mean, uh, we mentioned Zcash and Monero, and the trouble is Zcash and Monero are actually being actively used by nation states to get around sanctions. So... Again, I get back to it needs to be a more nuanced dialogue at the community level. And the challenge and the question that has not been answered in my mind is, are these going to be communities by geography or are these going to be communities by ideology? Because if it's communities by ideology, you end up in situations much like certain nations in Eastern Europe, I won't name specific ones, where you have a far left and a far right that co-locate the same location, yet feel like they actually can't talk to each other. And it's not just Eastern Europe. Um, in 2020, December of 2020, according to Pew Research, 85% of people on both sides of the political aisle in the United States felt like the other party not only was someone they disagreed with, but actively hurt the country. And so I think we've got to figure out a way to, to resolve this rift. Otherwise, we may find that I would say the last 15 to 20 years has been the neo-Victorian era of virtue signaling, where signaling matters more than what actually gets done. And the way that, of course, got ended was World War I happened. Uh, I hope that's not what we're going to see in the future ahead. But I raise that because I think we need to not go for absolutism, but instead community-centric recognition that it's going to be different choices around the globe. Great. Well, that's maybe not a bad place to end. We could have a whole another huge conversation on your last point, uh, <laughs> ideology or community or geography. Uh, that we'll say for another time. Let me say thanks to all three of you, all four of you, including Patty, for a great conversation. Uh, we could have continued this for a very long time. I look forward to the next time. Let me also say again, thanks to our partners, to Pat Patrizia and Stefano uh, on the IFDD and their sponsors. This has been a, a great opportunity to put together some old friends and have a very good conversation in the process. So thank you very much.